What is going on ladies and gentlemen? My name is Lucas. Welcome to my channel. Today we're going to be talking about a very special species of snake. This is going to be one of those deep dive species specific videos. Um, I've done these in the past for uh, the Brettles python uh, as well as Woma pythons and black headed pythons. So if you have not seen those videos and you're interested in those species, you can go check those out when you're done watching this video here. But today we are are talking about the inland carpet python, uh, Morelia spilota metcalfe. Also known as the Murray Darling Carpet Python, inland carpet pythons are native to Australia, of course, and in the wild they inhabit a pretty immense geographic range. From the hills around Adelaide in southern Australia, through northern Victoria, and throughout much of the interior of New South Wales. And inland carpet pythons are one of those species where even though they're widespread geographically, they aren't necessarily considered common in any of those areas, uh, kind of similar to the Wilma python. This is one of the smaller members of the carpet python complex. Neonates hatch out really small, uh, just diminutive little things around 20 grams, and adults tend to stay between four and six feet. Of course, as always, there are reports of larger specimens, but those animals are the exception. And while these particular carpet pythons exhibit less variation in color and pattern compared to other members of the carpet python complex, they are extremely beautiful animals. Their base color tends to be a shade of gray or brown, maybe even reddish brown in certain places. But then also kind of the most striking thing about them and one of the things that they're most known for is the blue color that they tend to exhibit, uh, usually on the ventral side, on the belly in certain specimens. Inland carpet pythons exhibit varying amounts of this blue color and it's hard to catch it on photograph. Um, but when you do see them in person, a lot of the times there is a blue hue uh, in the right light, which is really cool. And hatchlings of this species do undergo the ontogenetic color change. Um, neonates will be born without uh, a lot of those blue and red tones and will color up as they age. And sometimes the background color of the snake lightens up with age as well, and you get more contrast in the adult animals. Now, while being on the small side, these are a medium build python. They're pretty close to round in the midsection, and they are not particularly laterally compressed. And like most other carpet pythons, they do have that big broad head, which is distinct from the neck, and they also, of course, have a prehensile tail. Uh, they are semi-arboreal as a carpet python subspecies. And because inland carpet pythons are spread over such a large geographic range in the wild, they do inhabit a lot of different environments. They are often associated with riparian woodland, river red gum forest, and black box woodland. And they may also be found in swamplands, uh, favoring large trees along watercourses. And in the wild, a lot of the inland carpet python's natural habitat has been converted to agricultural land for human use. And the habitat of inland carpet pythons in the wild is disappearing at an alarming rate. Um, they now really only have patches, uh, a mosaic of their preferred habitat type in a lot of areas. And it does appear that this land use change has had negative effects on the inland carpet python. And they are considered endangered in certain parts of their range, particularly the southern part of their range. So inland carpet pythons, just like Brettles pythons, experience extreme weather conditions from freezing colds in the winter to high heat events in the summer. Rainfall is also quite variable in their natural habitat and extended periods of drought are not uncommon. And because of this, just like Brettles pythons, the inland carpet python is extremely resilient to temperature extremes, which makes them very hardy in captivity. And another thing that goes along with that is that they too are spring breeders rather than winter breeders. So again, just like Brettles pythons, these snakes breed when things warm back up in the spring, not when it's really, really cold in the winter. And during those really hot parts of the year where temperatures in their natural habitat can exceed 100 degrees easily, uh, these snakes don't move around much during the day. They become primarily nocturnal when the temperatures are that hot. And then during the cooler times, they are very efficient at conserving 
conserving their energy. Studies have found that these snakes are able to keep their body temperature well above ambient temperatures when it gets cold. So in addition to being extremely temperature tolerant and hardy, another reason that inland carpet pythons are uh, really underrated and make for great captives is that they tend to be very calm and docile. Uh, just like Brettles pythons, it has even been reported that wild specimen are reluctant to bite and tend to be pretty placid. And this demeanor followed them into the captive setting. They're known for being very agreeable snakes. There's always exceptions to the rule in every species, and I'm sure that not all inland carpet pythons are reluctant to bite, but it is much more common for them to be docile than for them to be nasty. So if you're keeping score at home, they're beautiful, they don't get too big, and they are pretty reluctant to bite, and it really is mind-boggling why they aren't more popular. It does seem like they are becoming more popular, at least here in the United States. So in the wild, inland carpet pythons tend to overwinter in rocky outcrops. Uh, they take shelter when it's really cold, and then they disperse more wildly during the summer, primarily seeking prey. One of their main prey sources in the wild is the invasive European rabbit, uh, which is interesting as this demonstrates the ability of the snakes to utilize a new food source that was not previously around in Australia. And they will primarily feed on other mammals and birds. Uh, as juveniles, their primary prey probably is skinks and lizards. Because they do feed on lizards and other reptiles when they're young, they can be a little bit tough to get going as hatchlings, just like a lot of other Australian species. So you might have to get creative to get them started on food, but once they're started, once they're established, they tend to be great feeders in captivity. And like I mentioned earlier, although inland carpet pythons are able to adapt to some human disturbance, they are not necessarily well suited for all types of disturbance, and they are listed as endangered in certain parts of their range. And again, the primary driving force behind that is habitat loss due to human agriculture. They're also preyed upon by foxes, and according to the Melbourne Museum, they're also pretty commonly killed by humans, even though they are largely harmless and natural enemies of pests that people don't tend to like around. So it is unclear whether males combat in the wild for inland carpet pythons, although it has been observed in captivity upon occasion, they do seem to be a more passive subspecies in general. And for this particular subspecies, males actually tend to be smaller than females as well. Male combat might not have a really big role in their reproductive strategy. Males tend to be bigger than females in species that combat, because the selective pressure is then for bigger males, right? The bigger male tends to win the fight, uh, so males get bigger generation after generation after generation because those are the snakes that are passing on their genes. And so unlike some other carpet pythons, when inland carpets lay a clutch of eggs, they don't leave the clutch. They're gonna stay coiled around it for the entire duration of the incubation period. And then once the eggs hatch, the female will loosen her coils and the hatchlings will disperse. Wild specimen have been found to incubate their clutches within burrows as well as tree hollows and even in disturbed areas in and around people's houses, pretty much wherever they can find a nice, safe, thermally stable environment. Clutch sizes of 10 to 50 eggs have been reported, but the smaller clutch sizes are more common. And it is thought that because of the really harsh environment these snakes live in, the females probably only breed every two or three years. Females are capable of shivering to generate heat during incubation, like other species of carpet python. That's such a cool behavior for a cold-blooded animal to be able to generate heat. So here in my snake room, I'm fortunate enough to be working with a pair of inland carpet pythons. They were produced in 2020 by Nick Mutton, and I'm so excited to have them here. In the US, the two main lines that you're going to hear referenced are the Moog line and the Schofield line. And each of these lines have a little bit of a different look to them. And there you have it guys, so the Inland Carpet Python, one of the rarer uh, carpet pythons in US collections, but also one of the coolest, uh, most docile, most hardy pythons you can keep. And luckily their popularity in the hobby does seem to be growing and they are becoming more common. It seems possible to me that in the future Inland Carpet Pythons might be one of the more popular 
pet carpet pythons to keep. As they become more common and more frequently bred in the hobby, I think a lot of people are going to realize just how cool these snakes are. Well, thanks so much for watching, guys. I hope you learned something new about these amazing semi-arboreal carpet pythons, the inland carpet pythons. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them down below. I will read and respond to everything that I can. And as always, thank you so much for watching the video. Uh, please give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. So once again, my name is Lucas for Centralian Exotics, and I'll talk to you in the next one. Thank <laughs> you.